So today's speaker is uh, Matthew Saremski, and um, he will be talking about Vietoris Rips complexes and geometric group theory. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to kind of, um, to some extent, infiltrate your seminar with geometric group theory. <laughs> I looked at uh, the titles, at least, of, of all the previous talks and like, yeah, this isn't going to really have anything to do with 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 anything that uh, most of you are experts on. So <laughs> we'll see. But I pretty much want to yeah, begin by covering some of the basics of geometric group theory and the sort of world in which we will be thinking for the next hour or so. And then I'm gonna talk about a thing that I don't know very much about. And then I'm gonna talk about a thing I do know about. <laughs> Just to warn you toward the middle, there'll be, there'll be this part where Perhaps I will I will be asking like, hey, are we allowed to do this? Is this okay? Anyway, let's start at the beginning. Geometric group theory. So the the main idea in geometric group theory is that instead of viewing a group, or in addition to viewing a group as an algebraic object, you want to view it as a geometric object, namely a metric space. So uh, here's how you do that: start with a generating set for your group. Call it S and I was gonna plug my mouse into the tablet so I can gesture with the cursor and, and you can sort of see it, but it looks a little laggy. Uh, okay, S is a generating set. And in anything that's gonna matter in a second, you want it to be a finite generating set. So you want your group to be finitely generated. Um, for this early stuff, it doesn't really matter. The, the word metric on the group, here's how you turn it into a metric space. You just define the distance between two elements to be the minimum number of generators you need to write the difference. You could call it the difference of the elements, G inverse H. And that turns out to be a metric. It's not super hard to, it's not super hard to prove that's a metric. In fact, it's exactly the same thing as the path metric in the Cayley graph of the group, if you, if you like that. Um, yep, so you can just do this. And uh, the very first thing, yeah, sorry, there's kind of a lot of words. Uh, the very first thing you want to use this for is to produce, pull it down a little, is to produce a, a, an interesting way of talking about two groups being roughly the same. Instead of just saying two groups are the same if they're isomorphic, that's too easy. And there's not a lot you can do with that, I guess. Um, viewing them as metric spaces, here's, here's this other notion. You say two groups are quasi-isometric if there are functions going between them satisfying a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> Let's try to work through this. So first of all, you need a function phi going from your one group to the other group, from G to H. And you want it to be C, D, Lipschitz which pretty much just means you don't want distances to blow up too much, right? You want, you want a multiplicative constant C, and you also allow an additive constant uh, D over here. And, and this is hard to look at, but it's just saying the distance between the images of any two elements is not bigger than the distance they started at, possibly blown up by this multiplicative factor and this additive factor. Uh, so you, you allow that. And then you call this a quasi-isometry if there's kind of like a reverse map. Psi, did I call it? Yes. Psi, going from H back to G, uh, also CD Lipschitz, such that when you like compose them in either direction, if you go there and back, or if you go back and there, uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily get the identity, literally, but you get something really close to the identity. Distances don't or, or the, the point doesn't move more than that constant D. Or you could use a new constant E if you wanted, just take the, the max of all the constants and get a universal constant. Okay, so yeah, it's kind of this notion of um, equivalence of groups up to coarse isometry, quasi-isometry. You say they're basically the same if the distances don't change that much. The immediate first reason this is important is that if you have a finitely generated group and you pick a word metric using one finite generating set and then you pick another word metric using another finite generating set, as long as both of those things really are generating sets, 
then these metrics are quasi symmetric to each other, it turns out. Um, I, I, that's even not really that hard to prove. Uh, you need them to be finite, though. You need finite generating sets. Yeah, so thanks to this, when you're viewing groups as metric spaces, you want to think about like the quasi isometry class of a group. And it's well defined because it doesn't matter which finite generating set you pick. Up to quasi isometry, you'll still be like talking about just your group. And now you can ask whether other groups are quasi isometric to your group. Um, and I'll mention this is a much coarser notion of equivalence than isomorphism. It's pretty easy for non isomorphic groups to be quasi isometric. For example, you see here all the non abelian free groups. Those things are all quasi isometric to each other. In fact, they're commensurable with each other. Yeah, so it, this is a, a much coarser notion of equivalence than just groups being isomorphic. All right, so we're viewing groups as metric spaces, it's finitely generated groups, really, always. We're viewing groups as metric spaces. We have this way of saying two groups are kind of the same. Um, and now let me connect it to the seminar topic. <laughs> Here's a connection to Viatoris Rips complexes. Let's say you start with two quasi isometric groups. You've got G and H. And these are their, these, these are the quasi isometries between them, phi and psi. And now I'm gonna, I don't know, get this like picture. <laughs> now I'm gonna take their rips filtrations. Each of them's a metric space. I can just do it. I can just take, you know, all the all the Viatoris rips complexes of each of them and get this kind of uh, this pair of you know uh, sequences here, filtrations. And then since the quasi isometries are CD Lipschitz and distances don't blow up that much, if you have a simplex here in RIPS TG, so all of those points are within T of each other, then when you hit it with phi, it goes over to H, and now the distances are not bigger than uh, C times T plus D, right? The distances didn't blow up too much. So you get a nice continuous, legit simplicial map. The, the, the vertices spanned a simplex over here by virtue of being sort of close to each other. You send them over here, they're still sort of close to each other. Now, now with this different parameter. Then you go back, you get like a zigzag thing. You, you bounce back and forth using a phi and psi and you get kind of this zigzag thing going on. So, you know, go back the other way distances again, don't blow up too much. And it turns out that because one of those defining properties of quasi isometry said that if you compose the two maps, you don't, you maybe don't get literally the identity, but at least you get something that doesn't move things more than D. That turns out to be enough to make this diagram commute up to homotopy, it turns out. And I guess Alonzo proved this, or maybe maybe it was known before. I don't know. Uh, OK, so in this way, a quasi-isometry between two groups gives us, I think this is a loaded term that maybe I'm not supposed to use. I'm not entirely sure. I, I said interleaving. I don't know. I'm friends with Mike Lesnick. I'll ask him at some point, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe a homotopy interlay. It only commutes up to homotopy. I don't know if that's bad. But anyway, there's this connection between the rips filtrations, right? <laughs> they're sort of they're sort of attached to each other in this way. Okay, cool. So quasi isometric groups give you interleaved rips filtrations. And in fact, actually, I guess so far, nothing really mattered that they were groups, right? They didn't even have to be groups, just metric spaces, come to think of it. Yeah. Okay. Definition. Now I'm going to start connecting this to things that I think about <laughs> gradually. Say a uh, definition. Here's a definition. Say that a, a filtration, really just any filtration of anything, um, but we'll use, you know, RIPS TG here. Call the filtration essentially n minus one connected. I, I don't know whether this is like a, I feel like this is probably not a standard term in, in applied topology because these things tend to be finite. 
and this would be sort of a vacuous trivial definition then, but uh, essentially n minus one connected if for all T there exists S maybe bigger such that when you include the T parameter complex into the S parameter complex, so viewing rips T as a subcomplex of rips S, um, all the homotopy dies up to the bound you wanted. So n minus one connected just means all the homotopy dies up to dimension n minus one. Essentially, n minus one connected means, well, maybe the individual pieces, the homotopy groups don't actually, they're not just like dead up to dimension n minus one, but for all t, there exists an S so that that inclusion at least induces induces the trivial map in homotopy up to the up to that n minus one. By the way, I'm using n minus one instead of n, and you might be looking at that like, why isn't he just saying n? Uh, it's just because I'm so used to certain things that this is what I always say <laughs> for for obnoxious historical reasons. N minus one connected is always the right thing to say. I guess I don't know. <laughs> okay, so that's so that's what essentially n minus one connected means. It means your filtration, like the individual pieces of your filtration, might not be highly connected, but for e at every stage you can find uniformly a spot higher, <laughs> so that this inclusion kills all the homotopy, all of it, at that stage. All right, you can do a similar thing with homology. You can do a similar thing with homology. N minus one, essentially N minus one acyclic, I suppose you would call that. If uh, say same thing, but now now you know it induces the trivial map in uh, in reduced homology. In in all dimensions up to N minus one. Okay, and now the reason I bring this up is because look, if you have two interleaved filtrations and the one of them is essentially N minus one connected, then so is the other one, right? Like this one's essentially n minus one connected. You want to prove this one is well. Just go over here, find a spot where everything died, and then go back and up to homotopy. It commutes. So there you go. You just killed everything from this uh, stage at that stage in the second filtration. Yeah, the hard the hard thing here was was getting this to. Can you give us an example? Uh, I guess the finite group. This is a trivial definition but for infinite groups so yes so good point should have said that probably at the very beginning in geometric group theory we tend to really only care about infinite groups yes uh yeah. you are right for finite groups everything here is trivial yeah. I have some simple example for example a one connected or two connected when this is not trivial um yeah so like so in practice a lot of the time you you you're your filtration pieces really are already however much connected. Uh, I guess the main one, like if you think of Z, then each one's just contractible anyway, right? Um, but you could imagine something like a, so this wouldn't be the rips complex of a group or anything, but picture a tree that's like hanging here and branching down forever. And then the filtration is kind of like chopping it in half in a certain way. So now you have all these disconnected pieces of the tree. So that sublevel set is not literally connected, zero connected. But if your tree is such that there is some uniform place up here where all of those disconnected things become connected by this, by this finitely higher stage, uh then then this would be essentially zero connected you know maybe maybe at every stage you have finitely many connected components but if you just go up like five higher those get connected and now maybe new ones appeared new new disconnected parts appeared uh, but it's still fine that would be a that would be an essentially zero connected filtration that's not literally zero connected at any stage but yeah Part of the problem is that it turns out as soon as a rips filtration is essentially simply connected, then the complexes are literally simply connected from some stage on. So 
you'd have to go to the higher ones like two connected, three connected, and it becomes a little hard to, to picture. But yeah, okay, thanks. Um, okay, good. So this is like an invariance now of, of quasi asymmetry classes, right? This is a this is an invariant of the rips filtration of a group that it, it's an invariant uh, up to quasi asymmetry. If two groups are quasi asymmetric and one of them has an essentially n minus one connected rips filtration, so does the other one. And uh, since we're working up to quasi asymmetry, the rips filtration is sort of well defined um because because we're we're it's okay if you change the generating set okay so yeah now here we go <laughs> this is the thing i study um definition a group g is said to be of type fn if now actually kind of ignore this blue definition, let me breeze through this blue definition. If there exists a connected CW complex whose fundamental group is G and whose higher homotopy groups are all trivial and where the end skeleton of that complex is finite. That's the official definition of type FN. Mm -hmm. It turns out F1 is equivalent to finite generation. Oh, okay. And F2 is equivalent to finite presentation. Oh, so obviously these are important. <laughs> I mean, those are important, so I guess all of them must be by induction or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but maybe here's here's what you should actually think about theorem, which I don't know if it's really like appeared. I don't know. It's essentially due to Brown. It's essentially due to this thing called Brown's criterion. Uh, it turns out that a group being of type Fn is equivalent to the thing we were just talking about for a while. A group being of type Fn, it turns out, is equivalent to its rips filtration being essentially n minus one connected. Um, and, and in particular, this is an invariant of quasi isometry. So Alonzo's theorem was that uh, these finiteness properties type Fn are, are QI invariants. If two groups are quasi isometric and one of them is of type Fn, the other one is of type Fn. And that was the proof. I've more or less done the proof by now. <laughs> you take the rips filtrations, the quasi isometry means they're interleaved in this way. And now type Fn means the one of them is essentially n minus one connected, and the interleaving forces the other one to be. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I, I, like I said, this is essentially due to Brown. The key property here is that the action of the group on any one of its RIPS complexes is proper and co-compact. So proper means finite stabilizers and co-compact means the orbit space is compact. That's the key thing. Any, any filtration of that sort, you would get this, but in particular, the RIPS filtration works because each piece of it, the action is proper and co-compact. Um, okay, good. So that's Alonzo's that's Alonzo's theorem. Here are a couple facts. Like I said a little bit ago, it turns out that in the n equals two case, and I guess the n equals one case for easier reasons, but in the n equals two case for finite presentability, uh, finite presentability that's type F two, and so that's the same thing as the Rips filtration being essentially simply connected, n minus one is is one. Um, but it turns out that that's actually equivalent to their existing a T where rips T of G is literally one connected, is literally simply connected and all the ones beyond it too. You, you kind of play around with like deforming paths and stuff like this. Yeah, so every, every finitely presented group has simply connected Rips complexes from some stage on. Question, is the same thing true for type Fn? No idea, nobody knows, I, I think, unless somebody's not telling me. <laughs> um, if your group is of type Fn, the Rips filtration is essentially n minus one connected. I have no idea whether it's true that there exists a, an n minus one connected Rips complex though. I mean, even for type F3, I don't know. Um, 
yeah, it's just kind of wide open as far as I know. So it should be true. It's weird. It, usually the, the, the difficulty is once you hit simple connectivity, usually like that's the hard one and then anything past there is kind of like, oh, and then the rest. <laughs> um, there doesn't there doesn't seem to be a a good reason for this to not be true, but I suppose I also just kind of don't know. <laughs> but what is true? Here's what is true. This last fact here: um, you're not going to get away with with a for all n thing. So it's not true that type f n for all n, also known as type f infinity, it's not true that that means you have a contractible rips complex infinity connected i guess is contractible um yeah that's not true counter example thompson's group f is a thing that i think about that uh i won't get into here but yeah turns out the rips filtration is essentially contractible so for every t there exists an s i don't know why i keep making s below s is bigger so it should be above for any t there exists an S such that the inclusion of the T rips complex into the S rips complex induces the trivial map in all homotopy groups. But you never discover a complex that's literally contractible. You never, you never hit a stage where all the homotopy is just dead and stays dead. Uh, yeah, very weird. So that's kind of too bad, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but Thompson's group sneaks in and ruins all sorts of conjectures. All right, here, now we enter the part that I know the least about and is, is sort of just hand waving. And then we'll go back to stuff I actually do. <laughs> Potential TDA connection, I guess. So we've seen that a group is of type Fn, if and only if the rips filtration is n minus one connected, you can do, and here I remind you what, what that means. You could also uh, talk about homology, so essentially n minus one acyclic, it turns out Brown's criterion again tells you this means your group is of type FPN. It's just another, another name for a thing, another property. And um, but now here's so here's a way of interpreting n minus one, essentially n minus one connected or essentially n minus one acyclic. All the pi k stuff that's alive at time t is dead by time s or you do H, HK if you wanna talk homologically. So something like this, um, G is of type Fn, if and only if for all K up to that dimension, there exists a function from the naturals to the naturals bounding the persistence diagram, I, I guess. Except I wrote, is this a thing? Because of course, everything here is infinite. And so you don't have like, barcode decompositions and these nice things. So I, I, I don't even know if you're allowed to talk about persistence diagrams. Also, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about pi k persistence to begin with, I guess. <laughs> HK, I think you do HK if, if it's dicey. But anyway, that's, I mean, that's pretty much what it's saying, right? If you're looking at your X values and you want anything that was born by then is dead by, by S. So for all t, there exists s, such that all the points in the persistence diagram have to stay below there in that column. And it defines, and it gives you this, this function bounding the entire persistence diagram, if you're allowed to, to say that. <laughs> so that's kind of neat that this, that this group theoretic property being of type Fn, and again, just think finitely presented if you want, for n equals two finitely presented is equivalent to this kind of TDA style thing about um, persistence diagram being bounded. I don't know, bounded, bounded by a function. I mean, not a constant. Um, anyway, so I don't know. This is like a thing I noticed like three years ago. I got to Albany four years ago and, and between Justin Curry and Mike Lesnick saw a lot of applied topology. <laughs> and at some point I kind of noticed this and I was like, this seems good. And then I, and then this is as far as it's ever gone. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what this tells us about anything. Here's a picture, a bunch of dots bounded by this, this function. There exists this function bounding the 
persistence diagram that maybe we're not allowed to talk about because it's an infinite metric space. But <laughs> so then the questions are just like, uh, is this legit? Maybe we do still get a barcode. To come. Maybe it is legit by virtue of, of the action of the group being co-compact, right? I mean, it's not a finite metric space, but it's kind of a co-finite metric space. The, there, there's finitely many orbits of simplices in the, in the Rips complex. So yeah, OK. So that's, so that's the end of the part of the talk where I don't quite know what's going on. <laughs> and, and now we can move to stuff I know about. <laughs> Here we go. All right, since these are infinite groups, a big question, a big question for, for any infinite metric space really is, um, are there any contractible Fiatora strips complexes? Does it admit a contractible one? Big question for, for which finitely generated groups, does there exist a parameter T where Rips TG is contractible. And I squeezed this in here. So I said that type F infinity means um, the Rips filtration is essentially contractible. There's this other finiteness property called type F star that, that I don't know that it, that it means uh, that there is a Rips complex that's contractible, but it does mean that there exists a complex on which the group acts properly and co-compactly that is contractible. Maybe it always has to be a Rips complex. I don't know. Maybe, maybe as soon as you admit a geometric action on some contractible complex, you have to do so on a Rips complex. It could be, that, that definitely could be. But anyway, type F star, just think like contractible Rips complex. That's, that's definitely a consequence of being of type, or sorry, that's type of star is definitely a consequence of having a contractible Rips complex. All right, of course, the big example is hyperbolic groups. Uh, this is like why Rips's name is there, and this was his big result. And anytime I cite it, I always cite Brideson and Heffliger's book because I don't even, Rips himself, I don't know if he like published this or I don't know what's the deal there. <laughs> I don't know the history, but uh, yeah. If, if a group is delta hyperbolic, then yes, it has a contractible Rips complex, it's type F star, and it works for any, I, th I didn't double check this, but I think this is right, for any T greater than or equal to four delta, that sort of rang a bell. Um, what does delta hyperbolic mean in green here? This is what it means. It means that geodesic triangles in the Cayley graph are delta slim, which means that any side, this one, I'm. can you see my mouse kind of, yeah. Any side is contained in a delta neighborhood of the other two sides. So the dotted blue lines are supposed to be puffing up the other two sides to delta neighborhoods and you, you completely eat that third side. So this is like very much not the case for Euclidean triangles <laughs> when the midpoint of, of these guys is pretty far away from the other two sides. But yeah, that's okay. So that's hyperbolic. And Rips proved that that these these Rips complexes are contractible for large enough parameter if you have a, a hyperbolic group or a hyperbolic metric space. And honestly, not much else is known. <laughs> so what else has contractible? What else, what other groups have contractible Rips complexes? There is this result of all of these people here that says it works. If in the group with the word metric, every family of pairwise intersecting balls has non-empty intersection is the heli property. And actually, I guess it doesn't even have to be a group here. I think I think this is true of any metric space, or like a discrete, topologically discrete metric space at least. If if it's true that any family of pairwise intersecting balls has non-empty intersections, somehow this forces the, the Rips complexes to be contractible for large enough parameter. Um, Matt, could I ask a question there? Yeah, go for it. You know, so applied topologists might say morally, this property is saying that the Rips in the check complex or the nerve of the balls, is it, so it, is it potentially a nerve theorem type things? Uh, yeah, I think, right. So it's kind of saying like you're already flag 
uh, so you're already check. And I, I guess the parameters, well, no, I guess, right. It is just saying rips T equals check T over two would it be, or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, nerve stuff comes into play here. And, and one uh, quick question. So uh, when you, when you have um, this uh, assumption that every family of pairwise intersects in balls, they are allowed to have different radii or are they? Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah, this seems to be the hyperconvexity property for. Uh, there are names I've spaces, been, yeah. yeah, hyperconvex injective. I've seen it called injective metric Ex space. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I feel like there was another name. <laughs> well, heli heligraphs they call them, and then a heli group, you know, is a group whose whose heligraph is heli. Yeah. So and then they and then they run through examples. Uh, most whoops, most prominently z squared with the this weird generating set take the two standard generators and then toss in their products uh, this this works more generally if you have a right angled art and group and you do a similar thing with this unusual generating set if you don't know what a right angled art and group is don't worry about it but uh but anthony genevois has i don't know claimed to me that there aren't a lot this doesn't really provide that many examples their paper's like 70 pages long and it's very impressive. And it's like, look at all these examples. But then over email, he was like, um, oh, but I don't think this is going to give you uh, too much. <laughs> so I, I think he was just being modest or something. But yeah. Um, but he's right that this doesn't work for the sorts of groups I was hoping it would work for. So <laughs> in, in particular, question is rips t z to the n, even just for z to the n. I mean, does this have contractible rips complexes using the standard generating set? That that heli generating set is fine, if maybe slightly unnatural or something. Um, I, I really just want to know if this works for the standard generating set. Say for t greater than or equal to n, uh, you would want. It does not have the heli property. It's not too hard to draw some L1 balls that that like uh, pairwise intersect. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, I can't picture it now, but the pairwise intersect, but don't, but don't globally intersect. I thought I had worked this out. Yeah, I can't picture it now, but well, okay. Should think about that again. <laughs> but anyway, so Brendan Mallory and I have some partial results. I would have to look up exactly what all we have. It's sort of a patchwork thing definitely rips two of z2 is contractible and then in talks with uh, henry adams and michael moy we've made some progress perhaps on i, I yeah i just want this to just be true <laughs> rips t of z to the n for t greater than or equal to n uh that, that really just ought to work so we'll see let me so the last thing i want to talk about is a thing I actually proved, <laughs> finally. Here is a general criterion, which does not apply to z squared, unfortunately. Um, but here's a general criterion that gives contractible reps complexes. And I guess I would just like to find more applications of it. So let G be a finitely generated group. Doesn't have to be a group. I think it needs to be topologically discrete. Let, me let the cat through the door here. I think it has to be topologically discrete and, and maybe some, some other little conditions. But um, consider, consider this, let T be in N. I mean, all, all the distances are, are whole numbers. So you could take T and R if you really want. Here's the criterion. Suppose that for all X and Y, here they are in the picture, say with distance S greater than T, for all sufficiently far away x and y, there exists a z, and you should picture it as being kind of in the middle of x and y, such that for all w as close to x and y as they are to each other, so for any equilateral triangle you form, or, or w could be even closer, uh, we have this property. We have that z is even closer to w. That strict inequality is annoying but necessary <laughs> if that's a less than or equal to it doesn't work you need a less than here so if you have all that then the rips complex is contractible at parameter t
So the T here was like, S had to be bigger than T here. And so in particular, then a, a group satisfying all this is of type F star as a contractible groups complex. Yeah, so here's the picture, there's X, there's Y. Here's the Z that exists so that any W within S of both X and Y is strictly within S of Z. That's what you need to happen. If it's living in Euclidean space, this is easy. Just take the midpoint of X and Y, and then it works for some reason, something like square root of two is bigger than one. I feel like that's, that ends up being the reason it works. It even works on a sphere as long as uh, T isn't too big. You hit a problem as soon as the points are like a quarter of the circumference from each other. So they're on the equator because then the north and south poles are both within one fourth of each of X and Y, but they're within a half of each other. So there's no way this Z could exist with, with the distance being strictly less than a fourth, right? Something strictly less than a fourth plus something strictly less than a fourth isn't gonna reach a half. <laughs> um, but for, it, it works on the sphere up to, up to that that spot where it starts not working. And it works all the time in Euclidean space and hyperbolic space and stuff like this. Yeah, so the proof of this uses Besvina Brady Morse theory, which I'm always happy to talk about, but I figured for this, I would not be able to get into the nasty details of that. <laughs> uh, so let me just say what I used this for and then wrap up 35 minutes, yeah, sure. Uh, so far, what I can do with this is get type F star for some groups. Asymptotically, cat zero groups is the, is the main class I can handle. These include hyperbolic groups. So this like recovers Rips's result. Um, and what it is, it's, it's groups whose asymptotic cones are all cat zero spaces. Uh, hyperbolic groups, they're all R trees and trees are cat zero. So this is a generalization there. Uh, but outside asymptotically cat zero, yeah, it's hard to get this criterion to apply. There should be more groups where this criterion applies. Wild conjecture, I, I don't know, for years I've sort of thought this would be neat to prove. I have like no idea if it's actually true, so I'm calling it a wild conjecture. But uh, yeah, it sort of seems like if G is both amenable and automatic, which I'm not going to define, then it should have a contractible Rips complex. And so in particular, if this was somehow true, which I really have no idea, but <laughs> it, would, it would humorously prove that Thompson's group F can't be both amenable and automatic, but it wouldn't actually say which one breaks. It would just say, well, it can't be both. So these are like two really big open questions about Thompson's group F. Nobody knows anything about whether it's amenable or not. Nobody knows anything about whether it's automatic or not. I just think it would be funny to prove that it can't be both, but then like not say which one, <laughs> not actually say which one fails. Uh, and, and Rips complexes could do that in theory. I, I sort of, yeah, if the group is both amenable and automatic, existing examples of such groups are pretty much like abelian groups, virtually abelian groups. <laughs> There's very few examples of things that are both amenable and automatic. So it's a little bit, yeah, it seems like it ought to be extremely restrictive. Anyway, yeah, just wanted to end with a wild conjecture. So <laughs> thanks. Uh, thank Matthew. Thanks very much for the beautiful talk. Do we have any questions or comments? So you did you ask the question with the rips at a certain scale of Zn with a standard generating set is contractible? Yeah. Can you yeah. can you maybe give some idea of why this might be difficult? I think the reason it's difficult is because the in in existing examples where you can get contractible rips complexes, there's some sort of like negative curvature or non-positive curvature or like at least geodesics kind of fell a travel a little bit to some extent but with with something like z to the n with the standard generating set you have these wildly diverging geodesics 
Um, and that seems to be sort of the problem. It's, it's extremely not non-positively curved and, and you have nowhere near unique geodesics and this somehow creates problems. Um, and even the heli property where the pairwise intersecting balls all have to have a common intersection. Again, that's kind of like a, a non-positive curvature-esque property where like as soon as they touch a little bit, they get pulled in and have to all kind of touch in the middle, something like that. Zn samples are in, right? So instead of increasing T, you can think of this as sampling Euclidean space with the mm -hmm. L1 metric, I guess. Um, yeah, so you could look at the L1. That's a fashion, and then don't the standard theorems give you that the same homotopy type as Rn? I don't think so. I think something to do with um, non-contracting. So with L infinity, so Henry pointed out at some point that with L infinity, it does work, but with L1, right? Okay. You, you know, the stability of persistent homology would say that, you know, something about the bar lengths, but that doesn't. You want bar lengths zero, right? Yeah, like, you know, they're uniformly bounded and little or something, but you want, you need like literally zero, so. Yeah. So, yeah. so your criterion is uh, applicable to uh, Rn, for example, right? But not to Zn. But Rn and Zn are uh, quasi isometric. So, so you, you, your theorem is not quasi isometric invariant, then? Or I'm well, confused here. Yeah, you have to. Which metric are you talking about, though? So, my criterion applies to Rn with the Euclidean method, with L2, yeah, I guess yeah. that is. Yeah. Uh, and, and so actually, right, so I should have said rips T Zn, if Zn has the Euclidean metric, then all of this works, yeah. So Zn with the Euclidean metric and with the L infinity norm. Um, right, but if you use word magic, uh, despite the fact even that they are quasi isometric, it's not applicable directly. Oh, right? oh, oh, I see what you're saying, um, right the criterion is pretty susceptible to small changes. You see here, this right, strictly less this than n. Right, there, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep, yeah. yeah, the criterion is susceptible to tiny changes. Ah, and here's a chat question. What would be one way to approach the problem of legitimacy of the persistence diagrams? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, so I guess I sort of just don't know enough about like how barcode decompositions are allowed or like why it works, uh, but it somehow involves finiteness. And the key thing here is that even though it's an infinite metric space, and I guess the pieces of the filtration can have infinitely generated homology and stuff like this, uh, the action of the group is co-compact. So sort of it's it's a finitely an infinitely generated vector space, but as a G module, it's finitely generated. I suppose you'd sort of have to shift from from looking at uh, sequences of finitely generated vector spaces to sequences of like finitely generated G modules. Maybe that's about as far as I've gotten. <laughs> Uh, as, as a, comment on that. Sorry. Yeah. Well, for your definitions, you only need your uh, bonding maps to be trivial, right? You don't really have to refer to barcode. For any of, right, for any of my stuff, I never really have to. Oh, you mean for this thing that I, that was, that was very hand wavy. Um, right. For this bounding, for the bounding function. Right, you can just say it. Yeah, you don't need barcodes. That's true, but I, I guess I worried whether you're even allowed to like call this a persistence diagram. It's not like I don't know whether it's really accurate to say that the homology, that the homotopy classes have a definitive birth time and a definitive death time, and it, it might get a little hairy. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. But for your uh, uh, properties and definitions, you don't really need them, right? You just need right, to say right. On a certain interval, everything is trivial. You don't need yes. to count the bars or the lengths, right? Right, yeah. So for all t, there's an s so that everything that was alive here is dead by here. Yeah. So this function exists, yeah. 
Yeah, I guess at some point I was I, I observed this and I was like, oh, and now I bet a bunch of tools from from topological data analysis will tell me things about groups, and uh, <laughs> not yet. But show that diagrams do exist in some context. I feel like there should, yeah, there should be something to do with the fact that even though it's not finite dimensional, merely over the field, it like is over once once the group starts acting, uh, something like this, yeah. Some sort of finite dimensionality seems to still exist in these contexts. Isn't it just equivariant homology or cohomology that you? Um, yeah, I suppose. So you could, so, okay, right. So you do persistence stuff with, instead of like coefficients in a field, coefficients in a group ring or, or something like this. Um, yeah, I feel like I just don't know enough ring theory <laughs> to, to really get a handle on. I think also part of the problem is I'm not entirely sure what the question is. I feel like there's like a solution in search of a problem happening, <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, what is known about it? So if a group satisfies H star property, so what is known uh, about the group? I mean, can you say about the converse connection? Um, so it cannot contain arbitrarily large copies of Z to the N. I mean, arbitrarily high rank z to the n's that's that's the first thing that comes to mind um this is essentially why thompson's group f is not of type f star because it contains z to the infinity um if you additionally know that your group is residually finite then being of type f star means you have a finite index subgroup that has a compact classifying space so it has finite cohomological dimension. It's sort of a um, very uh, tightly controlled group. The more, so F star has only been around for a couple of years under that name. Type F is more well-known. Type F just means you have a, a finite classifying space. Um, if you're torsion-free and type F star, then you're type F. So that's kind of a, a reason to care about type F star also. But F star is nice because you don't have to care if your group is like torsion free. It's it's annoying there are these examples out there like uh, mapping class groups out of N, these sorts of things that like, well, they have a little bit of torsion, but other than that, <laughs> you have all these results of that form. So it's nice to have this this close analog of, of type F that allows for a little bit of torsion. Matt, I was hoping I could plug your uh, Pespina Brady Morse theory a little bit. So, <laughs> so I encourage uh, applied topology folks to check it out because you know we often think in terms of Morse theory, but often don't have a Morse theory, say when studying groups complexes. So, so Matt's Morse theory, you you um, you, you sort of uh, it's a Morse function, but not to the reals, but to sort of R two lexicographically ordered using things like. Um, dimension and diameter or, or maybe one of them is negative um, negative yeah yeah and, and yeah. so far i think matt's used it mainly for contractibility but it'd be nice to also get examples using it to, to observe new homotopy types you know once the homotopy type changes as well yeah and uh, right so the i think in in Foreman's discrete morris theory you can view things in terms of descending links and you have these things like if you know if you have one a uh, face where the Morse function goes up, then your descending part is kind of the whole boundary of your simplex except for not right there. So that's contractible. That's like a sphere with a puncture, contractible. And then for the simplices that get matched to a higher dimensional thing, then, um, so you have a higher dimensional thing that, that's a lower value Morse function, then your descending link is like, well, you have some part of the boundary that maybe you don't quite know, and then this one definitive coface that serves as a cone point on the descending link. So again, contractible. So with Foreman, yeah, when you're doing Foreman, the descending links of the non-critical cells are always uh, contractible. But with Besvina-Brady, it's just like, it is what it is. You have a descending link. 
it's this thing. If you can understand it, then you'll say stuff about your complex. <laughs> it doesn't have to be contractible. Ironically, in all my applications, right, it was it's contractible anyway. <laughs> but in theory, this should be able to, to tell you some, some stuff that Foreman couldn't handle, I guess. Um, but yeah, right, this is yet another thing where it's like, yeah, that would be nice to come up with examples and then actually finding them is hard. <laughs>